My name's Simon. Um, I've been working with Jackie and, and Phil Ward at the Bondi Centre for probably five or six years now in this area and, and my discipline background is exercise physiology and now I'm working here at, at UNSW in a lecturer role and, and trying to promote the, the role of EPs within mental health more broadly. Hi everyone, I'm Jackie Curtis. I'm a psychiatrist and I've been working as a clinician in early psychosis um, in the South East and Sydney Local Health District for a very long time. I won't tell you how long. About, about as long as Julian. We trained as registrars together. So um, it's a while. Not too long. Um, and I've been working uh, with young people with um, first onset of psychosis and that's been a while I've been doing that. But in the last decade, um, my, with a collaboration with um, a a team. We've been actually focusing very much on the physical health of young people with psychosis and trying to improve physical health outcomes and in particular um, prevent uh, the cardiometabolic issues that you've been hearing about from Julian today. So it's wonderful to be here today. And uh, I'm here really talking from the perspective of uh, someone who uh, works clinically with people with intellectual disability and complex needs. Um, I do very limited practice. I wish I could do more but time doesn't really permit that, uh, and um, I'm trying to link what I'm doing in that practice with best practice uh, as we're stating in the algorithm. And just as a um, start off for today, I'd just like to acknowledge the work of um, these two people here on my right, as well as Phil Ward uh, and Andrew Watkins, and have I missed anyone? Kathy Samaras. And Kathy Samaras, of course, who couldn't be here today, because really, uh, their approach to proactive uh, cardiometabolic cardio health in people with mental illness is what has driven uh, this work. It's been the underpinning, and the uh, I'm sure Jackie will share that with you, the underpinning of this. So without the work they have done, there's, uh, we wouldn't have an algorithm adapted for people with intellectual disability. The first question from the panel, how can early intervention framework be used practically in your own discipline? Yeah. Who, who wants to go first? I'm do happy day. to do that. Yeah. Okay. Right. Can you all hear us? Yep. If you had a small mic, Regrettably, we don't. Uh, the only speak up. Okay. Shall we stand as we each yes. are speaking? It's better to stand help? anyway because we yep. are better for our health to stand oh, than yes. to sit. So as we're speaking, if we stand up and shout. I think we should all stand all the time, shouldn't we? Do 30 minutes. Because actually all of you can stand too because you know standing's actually... Should we all do a bit of a stretch? I've been sitting here for quite a long time and I won't make Simon do this because we always do... Everyone stretch up. Okay, and now sit down on your chair, but not right down on your chair, just halfway down. Okay, up again. <laughs> and again, down. Okay, up. Two more goes. Let's see how much better you feel with that. Up. Even if you've got high heels on. Down. <laughs> okay, now you're very welcome to relax and sit down or to stand, whatever you prefer. And um, Simon, and working with Simon for a long time, has made me realise that standing is actually really important. Um, we've got standing desks in our workplace because standing is actually role modelling good um, physical health and early intervention actually starts with clinicians and staff and then you role model that to um, everyone that you're involved with, consumers, carers, etc. So I think it's really important that we all pay attention to our health as well as um, then we can speak about health of others. So can you hear us okay now? <laughs> Good. All right, so just I just like to focus on why this is actually a really important launch that you're being in, um, witness to today and I really do congratulate Julian and all of your team in developing this. I know we've had something to do with it but really the driving force has been you and your team in, in making this possible and you've heard today how important this topic is. I think just to share the history of how it came about that we developed at the original um, algorithm would, would maybe help to inspire you to see where this can go and so I'm sharing it with that in mind where you can take this particular new resource in the um, population for, for people with intellectual and developmental disability and, and actually even though Julian said at the beginning this is, a, this is not everything, this simple, well, your simple resource that you've developed, actually I can tell you how much influence a simple piece of paper has had, and I'm sharing that so that you can be inspired for where you can take this. So basically, um, uh, in 2010, 
uh, we'd already been thinking about the physical health of young people with psychosis for a long time before then, but we, we realised there was a gap. Clinicians didn't know what to do when young people with psychosis who were taking medications put on weight. They didn't know how to deal with that. They didn't know how to deal with blood pressure problems, diabetes arising, etc. So we worked together with Catherine Samaras, a professor of um, endocrinology, who couldn't be with us but is part of the um, actual original group. So myself and Cathy and then a med student, Hannah, My Hannah Newell, who's now Hannah Miles and a psychiatry registrar, um, she, uh, three of us developed this simple, simple tool for clinicians. It was actually for registrars to help them know what to do in this situation. When do we worry? What waist circumference do we start thinking this is a problem? What blood pressure level do we worry about? Because in mental health we've often lost some of the skills as being um, health professionals, even though some of us have been trained you know, in, as doctors beforehand. <coughs> So we developed this tool and it actually became very, um, it was taken up with great interest by the group who were registrars, but the general practitioners who were sitting in the audience took the tool back to New South Wales Health in 2010 and they said, we really like this as general practitioners, we want this, can you put it through our system? And without us having anything to do with it, it became adopted across New South Wales Health through the mental health um, office. It then took on a life of its own after that. So it's really been um, rolled out across multiple areas after that. The GPs were instrumental, so those of you who are GPs in the audience, uh, really thank you for that, but also it's the advocacy you have around your um, client populations that you, that you can make such a big difference with by saying, yes, I want to know what to do. So that's how it started, um, and really that was in recognition of the life expectancy gap of people with psychosis. So that's what um, drove this very much like what you've just heard from Julian, it's a similar sort of figures for people with psychosis. After that, um, it was adopted across New South Wales. Clinicians took it on. So clinicians in their offices have these things on their walls, mental health clinicians all around New South Wales. We found it across in people having it in Western Australia. People it just caught on as a life of its own, not because we promoted it. So you've got great opportunity because it's already at a level where it's on a website. You actually can launch it and it's much more formalised. We didn't start it like that. It had a wide impact. It got... Um, uh, clinicians doing things differently. There was a lot of advocacy involved where the actual um, awareness that made it people realise this was an important topic was part of it. It wasn't just clinicians knowing what to do, it was, oh, this is a problem, what can we do about it as consumers and carers? Families became aware of these tools. We had some media um, uh, around a particular um, program that we were running and then we had stories about families who read this article in Wagga who would take the algorithm to their GP and say, I want this, I want something done about my son's um, obesity that's been caused by these medications. So lots of things, advocacy can happen again from the simple tool. Really it, it's about changing that health inequality that's already been, um, it's very clearly there for people with mental illness as well as people with intellectual disability. Then it started influencing policy as well, so New South Wales Health adopted it, um, the Mental Health Commission of New South Wales have endorsed the, the algorithm, the um, National Mental Health Commission's the College of Psychiatrists put it inside their clinical practice guidelines. So all sorts of things started happening with this tool. And then um, it also changed service development. So it's one thing saying, oh, here's a tool, let's use it. Another thing is to change practice. What we can say uh, now is that as a result of all this work, inside of mental health services in our own local health district is now a whole bunch of new multidisciplinary clinicians, exercise physiologists, dietitians who we have here today as well from our team um, and mental health nurses who are specialised in metabolic health are now funded positions inside of mental health services. Just like we have social workers and other disciplines um, already working in those places, we now have a change in the way that this actually works. So I think um, that's a real change in the culture of mental health service provision and I'm hoping that that will expand to the, the groups um, that, you're, um, that you're targeting with the with your algorithm. And obviously it inf influences research and that's been a, a very important factor too. Let's understand what we can do better. So these things are, are very powerful in that. And just finally um, about how it helps, it actually creates an international movement as well potentially and I'm sure Julian's going to have that um, opportunity with all your international collection connections. But not only was there a tool saying let's is what we should do, what we pulled together with an international group, because this has now been translated, well adapted in um, the UK, across the whole of the UK, it's inside every general practice and psychiatry um, clinic, it's, it's been literally rolled out across the NHS, Canada's adopted it, Italy, Japan, um, Finland, there's a, there's a whole 
range of countries who've taken it on, again, without us actually intending it that way. And then finally, together, as a collective group who are saying, Let's, what else can we do to make a change to reduce this terrible life expectancy gap that we know exists for people with psychosis? We developed what was an, uh, it's called the HEAL Declaration, which is the Healthy Active Lives Declaration. It's a decla an international declaration to improve the lives of people, young people with psychosis, so that they have the same expectations of life and life expectancy as people without psychosis. And there's a whole lot of targets. Uh, this has been done by an international, international collaborative that includes consumers and carers as well as researchers and clinicians and um, has been adopted and widely endorsed as well. And that's been also adopted across Australia. So uh, don't underestimate how important what you're hearing that, um, from this resource and the development of all the uh, um, tools that go around it. This can make a really big difference in the lives of people. We've seen it happen over the last decade, but more so since the algorithm was developed in 2010, and I really think this is a fantastic opportunity. Long answer, though. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to follow that. Um, so from our point of view as exercise physiologists, I think the, the importance of being included on this framework is, is twofold. And one, it's around advocacy and awareness. And I think that goes both ways, both in the mental health sector where people don't necessarily know what an exercise physiologist is, what an exercise physiologist does. And I'm sure if we sampled this room, most people probably would have limited idea. Um, so to fill you in, an exercise physiologist is an allied health professional um, that works predominantly with, with chronic disease and using exercise for prevention, but also to assist with treatment. Um, What's unique about Australia is we actually have one of the most progressive physical activity referral schemes in the world. Um, we've got a lot of countries looking to us and, and trying to get the same level of recognition for their sort of exercise professionals um, as allied health and, and, and coming up against a lot of roadblocks. So we have that here in Australia. We have an ability through Medicare for referrals to be made um, to a group of professionals that as part of their, their training are getting exposed to how to work with, with populations and, and conditions such as serious mental illness and also intellectual disability. So I think it's, it's, it's actually linking that together and, and letting health professionals know that we exist. Um, on the flip side is also promoting among exercise physiologists that these opportunities are out there. And there's this, this group of you know, a vulnerable population that's in, in need of these sorts of interventions and that they, there's a group there that can actually provide this. And I think the same goes for dietitians as well. And Scott Teasdale who's been working with the Keeping the Body in Mind project and driving the dietitians in mental health side of things as well. So I think you know the inclusion and also the practical aspects, so that the Medicare referral numbers and the item numbers actually help to provide clinicians with a way about how they can actually refer and, and initiate that process. Can I just ask a practical question? Is yeah. your profession listed on as an NDIS provider? Yeah, so listed as um, allied health, so alongside physiotherapy and speech pathology. So that's been one of the, the biggest um, achievements of the profession is getting that level of recognition. Um, but as we're finding out, the recognition is one thing, but actually promoting that uptake is another. So it was recognised in 2006. Um, there's obviously been considerable steps on the way that's, you know, and positive steps forward, but there's still a long way to go about it, uh, promoting what we do and getting it out there. Um, but I think that the key is that we have this group of professionals that are receiving the training, they're ready to go. It's just about actually implementing it. And I think the same goes with the evidence that Jeff Bellamy is an exercise physiologist working specifically in this area can talk to that, but we, we know the, the ingredients of a successful intervention, we know what we need to do, the issue is just about implementation. Yeah, sure, it's, it's a really good question, it's a difficult area. Um, traditionally, I mean, we're talking about exercise, so you know there are physiotherapists who can absolutely work in that space and they, they may be doing so. Um, it comes down to training as well. So within the exercise physiology curriculum and under our governing body, which is Exercise Sports Science Australia, we've made mental health and, and you know, as what's happening with intellectual disability, a priority area because that's where there's a lot of work and a lot of jobs for EPs going forward. So I think the difference is around training and, and the importance and, and the recognition within those professionals about um, the need to upskill and work in this area. Um, but yeah, absolutely, we have physios or exercise physiologists that can work in this space. Traditionally, physiotherapists will, may work in more acute settings, so acute musculoskeletal rehab might be one area. We often don't see exercise physiologists in that acute end of spectrum, they're more working in the chronic, um, you know, post-acute or, or long-term. The, the other avenue is also prevention. There's a lot of EPs and we've heard about the data around the importance of healthy lifestyle in terms of preventing these sorts of issues and, and that's a big role for exercise physiologists as well. Training. 
Yeah, so it's, it's a really good question. At the moment, it's, it is varied. We've got a, a new scope of practice and, and recommendations that, that set out exactly what level of detail um, courses, the university courses, will have to cover. So the basic accreditation for an exercise physiologist is a four-year undergraduate or a three-year um, plus a master's degree. There's clinical hours that have to be um, of practical experience that EPs have to be exposed to, so a total of 500. Um, and mental health is being worked into that as a, as a core component of exposure that, that exercise physiologists will have to have. There's been a big push from within the organisation to provide ongoing continuing professional development to EPs around this area and the resources that are up on the 3DN website as well have been promoted through the Exercise Sports Science Australia channels as well to encourage members to, to upskill. Um, and then expertise from people like Jess as well who have really got a lot of um, hands-on experience providing that to the membership as well. Do you want to mention the placements, the student placements in mental health as well? That's sure. Really so important. a big part of what we've done is, is, is the student placements, and that's one way of capacity building. And, you know, it is a relatively new area, um, but we're seeing a, you know, exponential growth in the amount of EPs working in this space. And I think in New South Wales, in the hospital system, we've now got more mm. EPs focused on mental health or dedicated to mental health than any other condition, which is quite amazing. Um, so the, the clinical placements are a big part of that and the, the supervision and also a way of expanding programs. So I mean Bondi, the, the, the program, the Keeping the Body and Mind program there, the gym, really a big part of that was having students involved with correct supervision. We can't rely on students, but to actually expand the capacity around that program. Could I also add that we hope within a year, working with Simon, Jackie and the team, to actually have some dedicated um, training resources available for exercise physiologists and dietitians and other relevant allied health groups as part of a healthy lifestyle intervention that we've now been uh, funded as a group uh, to develop. So we hope that might also equip uh, professionals in that area who haven't had the benefit of undergraduate exposure. Something else I'd just add is, is the previous literature that we know, especially in this area, but also in mental illness more broadly, is that the type of health promotion interventions and exercise programs often don't meet the, the basic principles of exercise prescription that we consider applicable to the general population. So we kind of have this idea of what, what the ideal program needs to have, um, and we're just not seeing that you know, in, in the previous research anyways, even without taking into account the, the issues, the, the, the additional barriers that people with ID or other mental disorders might, might be experiencing. So I think EPs have that base training in exercise prescription that can be applied to this population as well. Now, I'm also aware that um, we asked you to submit questions that have actually been given to Michael. And I just wondered, Michael, before we turn perhaps to two of those questions, and I could use the rest for the remainder panel, could I just say a little bit about practically how I might use that this in my clinic? Is that OK? Sure. Yep. Uh, so as I'm sitting in my clinic, uh, I feel that the algorithm at the top in the blue gives me an opportunity to be reminded of what domains I should be asking about and collecting data about. Some of these uh, points, for example, what is the latest fasting blood glucose, should have been provided to me by the referring doctor or by the ongoing uh, letters that come from the general practitioner. But others I might have to proactively chase or ask about or in fact measure myself but the fact that they're there in each of the domains means that I know really I should be focusing on each of those um, blue boxes and collecting that data or accessing it. If I don't have it, I need to chase it. Uh, I also uh, feel that uh, when I see that there's uh, a range, a uh, value outside that range, as a tertiary um, provider in the area, really it's not my role to uh, carry out an intervention. I just can't do that. But I do have the capacity to draw the referrer's attention to a value that's outside or a set of issues uh, around that. For example, the medication I might be prescribing might be encouraging the person to eat more, their lipid profile may be becoming um, abnormal, their uh, fasting glucose may be rising, and they may be putting on weight. So I now need to take action um, as a prescriber, thinking about what I'm prescribing, how much I'm prescribing, but I also need to assist the person uh, to active intervention for that problem. Now, in sharing the algorithm and the resources on it, either with the specialist that's referred them or the GP that's referred them, 
I feel confident that they have directions about how to proceed, but I would need to market this to them and push them. In reality, in primary care, uh, with um, someone accessing their general practitioner, there's a limited amount of time, and we know from analysing the BEACH data set, Australian National GP data, that GPs are overwhelmed with administrative uh, requirements, paperwork, uh, around the person with intellectual disability and don't have time to get to these more um, complex uh, and preventative um, aspects of healthcare. So we need to encourage that to happen. We need to tell the person with intellectual disability in their carer to book a, a long appointment. Uh, we need to make sure that GPs are aware of the need to spend more time to adapt their practice and we need to encourage them specifically to address these issues. Um, that is sometimes hard. Sometimes that requires me to be very proactive to ring the referrer to make sure they understand how important this is and to make sure they take action. But that's how I see it working uh, uh, for me as someone sitting in a, you know, a clinic, probably not in the real world clinical um, environment, but nevertheless um, using this tool, sharing it with the people that um, are referring uh, the individuals I see and being very proactive in making sure that the um, issues that are lying outside the range uh, and the standard targets are being addressed. And I think the postcards that you've developed alongside of these, mm. um, which is something that the UK have developed and we've just um, developed our spherical psychosis as well, these are really important for carers and consumers because sometimes you go to a GP, even if Julian's written a wonderful letter to the GP, but they may not have seen it or had the time. This is actually empowering carers and consumers, and I think that's really, really important in helping change mm. this um, situation. Yeah. The postcards will be something that you could also um, yeah. promote and share. So they can be printed off the website by anybody and taken. Okay? We don't have limitless resources to enable us to um, print and disseminate thousands or thousands of these that would be required. And these days, pretty much um, a lot of people have access or can ask someone to print one for them. Okay? So you know, I'd love to have thousands to send to everybody, but that's just not the real world. So, uh, about the uh, detection, the, uh, sometimes it happens, but uh, implementing assessment and then intervention, two other barriers. Mm. So, I have found what useful is actually working at GP practice one day a week. So, I referred to the nurse mm -hmm. in GP practice to do all those things mm -hmm. and actually do a healthcare plan. So they have the time and paperwork time. Yep. Because the GP, even when they do a long one, the paperwork takes 15 minutes. Yes. So, and it is uh, sort of self defeating because if you book a new appointment for this metabolic assessment, mm. again there's a paperwork to fill for that. So it sort of doesn't work. So that was one yeah. day I found. Useful. Excellent. But not all GP practice have nurses and mm. that. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's some nurses in the audience. I think they'd be very pleased to hear that uh, you're referring to them. So. And there's the MBSI. Yes. That, so yes. That's not a so where you've got a practice nurse, use the practice nurse. That's really good advice. Thank you. Well, I think that's what we do with our intervention sites. Like I did a case management on the nursing part of the team. They'll do the basic management. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. So now I'm aware that if we just keep fielding questions from the floor, we won't get to the ones that you kindly handed in for instructions earlier. Michael, are there is there a question that you could put to um, the people here, or should some of them wait for the next panel? Maybe we just do one more. Okay. Thank you. Sure. What have you found? are the best ways to challenge psychotropic prescriptions and could you view dates going forward by anyone? Could you just repeat the question so everyone can hear it? What have you found are the best ways to challenge psychotropic prescriptions 
and would we and would we do that going forward? So, for anyone. Okay, so challenging the prescription, wondering whether it should be continued, yes. and how do you review that? Yes. Okay, it is an excellent question. So thank you for the person who submitted that. That's probably one for Jackie or I. Oh, Jackie, <laughs> oh, do, you, you know, having, uh, do you want to give your perspective and then yeah. I could give the yes. mine? Yeah. Yep. I think it's a really important um, thing to do to actually question whether um, the person that you're seeing is actually in need of antipsychotic medications at all. So review the original. Cause sometimes people get prescribed medications in the emergency department and then a GP might think, oh, well, this is just um, something I just write repeat scripts of, etc. So reviewing the need for the medication, reviewing diagnosis is really important. Is this really needed? Always using the very lowest dose possible if it is needed, because sometimes it is needed. And then avoiding polypharmacy, avoiding using more than one antipsychotic medication. And we really we <coughs> emphasize this in the algorithm avoid polypharmacy and then if there is an opportunity, if there's weight gain and there's problems associated with the side effects of a medication, then you consider switching to a medication that's got less weight gain <coughs> potential. So it's really important to do as much as you can to challenge. It's, it's a very important thing to do for all clinicians. If you can't do anything about it though, because someone's on medications that's very helpful for their mental health issue, then you need to do other things. You can't just say, well, let's not worry about the diabetes that's developing. You need, you need to treat the conditions that's with other, for example, metformin or a, or a medication for cholesterol or blood pressure. So there's a whole range of things you should do. But um, as psychiatrists, uh, we go around trying to encourage other psychiatrists and general practitioners not to prescribe unnecessary antipsychotic medications. And this would be much, you know, more very important in your area as well. So there are a number of resources that are available, some of which we've developed. We have a clear guidance on our IDMH e-learning site around treatment of management of mental illness in people with intellectual disability and management of challenging behaviour. There are 13 modules for mental health professionals in that free online resource. Okay, you can access them. Uh, so I'll show uh, what that looks like later. Uh, there are several articles, including a couple that we've just recently written uh, one is aimed at general practitioners, so if you're a GP who asks that question, there's a recent article in the Australian Family Physician uh, that we've written on um, an approach to prescribing in people with intellectual disability. Um, we've also written something around autism uh, as well. Uh, we also um, have uh, written a number of book chapters which are very useful. There's the Therapeutic Guidelines book which is wholly devoted to developmental disability. An approach to assessment and management of mental disorders is a really integral part of that. Uh, and uh, there's an additional chapter in management of mental disorders uh, that we've recently written. So if you want clinical guidance in those areas, all of those resources are available. Uh, and some of the links are available as part of the uh, resources linked to this. I think in general, this is very difficult territory. We know that in in general, people with intellectual disability have higher rates of prescribing of psychotropic medication, but we also know that people have high rates of mental ill health. Now, sometimes uh, prescribing is very um, appropriately geared toward the person's need. Sometimes it's not. Uh, the areas where it's not, more often than not, are around challenging behaviour, where medication, psychotropic medication has been used for challenging behaviour. And the assessment and management of challenging behaviour is something that I think we could all do with upskilling about. Uh, so if there was one area of um, development of your professional expertise, I suggest that you know what is a sound approach to management. Um, and it's particularly important uh, when we think about reducing harms associated with restrictive practices uh, under which this comes, that we take this issue seriously. I see this as probably the next um, quite big and controversial area uh, in um, uh, mental health and management of behaviour that could potentially um, explode and actually expose quite a degree of uh, uh, bad practice and lack of access to effective services. Um, even driving in the car yesterday evening I heard some uh, stories around uh, dealing with behaviours of concern or challenging behaviour in a school context in younger people 
uh, and some really quite um, uh, uh, amazing stories of where it went horribly wrong and stories about when a person received appropriate behavioural support where it went very well and really good assessment of uh, the behaviour and uh, a very skilled assessment and implementation of a plan around that is the key. Um, psychotropic medication do does have a context of use in severe and enduring challenging behaviour where other things have failed. And sometimes it makes a profound difference to enable that person to engage in opportunities in life that they wouldn't have otherwise engaged in, but it must be done in uh, complement only with a very comprehensive uh, behavioural intervention. I, I think that's probably all we've got time for for this panel, so we might uh, close this panel. I thank Michael for your chairing. Thank you.